you have something really urgent, then uh, please, you know, uh, raise your hand and we'll try to address it as we go along. Otherwise, um, save them for the end. Hopefully there'll be some time at the end for a little bit of uh, discussion. <clears throat> so uh, the title is a bit vague, Scaling Up uh, Arthropod Evolutionary Genomics. Um, and in the time that we have today, obviously I, I can't present all of the different uh, arthropod genomics uh, projects that I have had the, the, the fortune to be involved in over the last few years, but uh, I hope to be able to give you a little bit of a taster of sort of the different levels at which uh, we are now beginning to explore arthropod gene and genome evolution. Um, before I get going though, I just want to briefly touch on some of the um, research avenues in my group and how they uh, sort of feed into uh, some of the projects that I'll uh, present afterwards. Then, uh, because it's quite a broad audience as well, why uh, arthropods, why this is our favorite uh, study system, and uh, let's say a more um, conceptual introduction to uh, some of the uh, approaches that we are trying to develop to better understand arthropod uh, gene and genome evolution. Then just uh, looking at the genus level uh, with the case study and the order level, and finally uh, across the whole phylum of Arthropoda. And then hopefully at the end, if there's a bit of time to briefly discuss what's coming up next in terms of uh, the new genomic uh, resources that are being generated and what this means for, uh, let's say, the future of uh, Arthropod evolutionary genomics. So the current uh, topics, themes uh, of research in my group are really focused on uh, connecting evolutionary and functional genomics in arthropods. And I try to summarize it here with just four major themes where uh, you'll see that uh, there's a heavy emphasis on methods, so the bioinformatics side of things, uh, including uh, methods to quantify what we call evolutionary features. So how genes evolve over evolutionary time across arthropod genomes, both in terms of sequence and copy number. Um, also methods to improve gene functional predictions, as well as uh, because phenotypes are expressed uh, beyond just the level of individual genes, but also uh, projects develop where we are trying to develop methods to capture large scale uh, arthropod uh, ecological uh, and uh, organismal trait data, plus uh, linking the evolutionary and the functional genomics uh, together with some transcriptomics efforts. So in terms of um, evolutionary features, just by starting with this example, one of the uh, pipelines or workflows that we're working on at the moment is uh, developing whole genome alignment uh, of multi-species complete genomes across arthropoda. And of course, as the number of genomes are increasing, this is a, a more and more challenging task. So we're really working towards optimizing this. And why are we doing it? It's because we want to be able to quantify uh, the level of evolutionary constraint at the nucleotide level across arthropod genomes. It also gives us as a sort of a secondary output, the ability to uh, analyze these uh, whole genome alignments to look for regions with uh, high levels of uh, coding potential. So this is either confirming annotated genes or uh, novel gene discoveries. So identifying, shall we say, lineage specific uh, regions with uh, protein coding potential that could encode novel uh, uh, innovative genes. And here, the uh, question that we're sort of trying to ask with this is what kinds of genes at, at the most basic level show uh, the most or the least uh, levels of constraint in terms of their sequence evolution. Then uh, following on from that, uh, not only looking at uh, sequence constraint, but also uh, gene family and uh, protein domain turnover rates and uh, sequence evolutionary rates, but this time at the level of the protein sequences rather than at the DNA level from the whole genome alignments. But bringing all of those together where we can combine uh, evolutionary features that focus on sequence changes and evolutionary features that focus on uh, copy number uh, changes or uh, spread across the taxonomy or the age since the last common ancestor where certain gene families emerged, we are trying to build what we call our evolutionary profiles for all genes in all genomes. And here we're basically wanting to ask the question of which kinds of genes 
show similar or different types of evolutionary uh, trajectories, if you like, from ancient, conserved, stable to young, dynamic and divergent. Now, of course, uh, both of those we, uh, questions we're, we're asking, what kinds of genes are constrained or not? What kinds of genes show what kinds of uh, different uh, evolutionary trajectories? And the first label, if you like, to try to as, as, assign a, what kind of genes these are is um, improving our understanding of gene function through improved functional predictions. And so this is a computational prediction of function rather than using uh, functional genomics data. But here, applying a, a meta approach or a consensus approach, if you like, um, where we're building machine learning models that are trained on uh, curated data from Uniprot to try to reevaluate the predictions from several different types of predictors and uh, rescore them to be able to be uh, more confident in uh, the ultimate gene ontology, in this case, uh, assignments. So this then allows us to answer the question of what kinds of genes are associated um, with which kinds of evolutionary profiles and what levels of evolutionary constraint. Then, like I said, uh, function is also expressed at the level of the organism rather than individual genes. So this is a very new project where uh, we're developing uh, text mining approaches of uh, arthropod life history traits to try to create a, a, a large comprehensive and consistent resource of basically stuff we already know, but that's trapped in the literature. <clears throat> And so we're uh, working with collaborators in the text mining field to examine, for example, species treatments and specific ecology journals to try to extract this information in a unified manner. So you can think of, for example, at a, a simple level, just what each and every single arthropod species eats. And so here, uh, this is more along the lines of uh, beginning to relate the changes that we can see at the level of the genomes that we're sequencing and annotating and comparing to arthropod life history diversity at a much, much larger scale than let's say the, um, the studies that we have been able to conduct uh, to date. And then finally, um, another form of function, if you like, or expression of function is in terms of uh, how genes are expressed. And here, this uh, research theme or avenue is um, really focused on uh, trying to connect the changes that we can observe at the genomic level with the changes we can observe at the level of gene expression. And here focusing on uh, the fly immune system, mainly because that's where I did a lot of work in my PhD on insect immunity. And so uh, I have a strong background, let's say, in the, the genes and gene families involved, involved in these processes. So basically trying to combine uh, what we can learn from our evolutionary feature quantifications with um, quantifications of how gene expression is changing between species um, to basically answer how do immune systems evolve while at the same time being able to maintain a very strong immune defense response. So that's a, a, a brief overview of some of the main uh, topics in, in the group. And some of them you'll see how they relate to uh, some of the studies that I'll present in a minute. But uh, for those of you who are perhaps not working directly on arthropods, um, uh, even if uh, it is obvious to us who do work on arthropods, why we love them and why we love to study them, it's important uh, to note basically this incredible diversity that is represented across the phylum in terms of uh, life history traits, in terms of morphology, in terms of the ecosystem niches that they are able to occupy, there's really an incredible amount of diversity. So if we want to ask questions about how uh, gene and genome changes or diversity at the genetic or genomic level are related to diversity at the organismal level, the arthropods really uh, present an excellent opportunity. So here in this figure is you know, probably one of the most famous examples, the invention, the evolution of wings that really transformed uh, the ability of insects to conquer uh, terrestrial earth. Then there are many other inventions that happened along the way, including, you know, for example, uh, um, ho holometabolous uh, metamorphosis, whereby you separate the, the, the life histories of the larval stages from the adult stages and can take up, uh, advantage of many more different ecological niches. 
Then uh, just in terms of all the other things that uh, they get up to, who eats who and how with uh, fangs and uh, stingers and venoms and camouflage and all the different amazing life history traits that are represented, as well as what they eat, how they see, how they feed, uh, how they hide, how they talk to each other, how they communicate, um, and all of their different uh, morphological uh, forms. So this is why we use arthropods as our study system. So the question then uh, to follow on is sort of where does this diversity come from? And uh, thinking about it, uh, trying to answer this question, you could uh, consider two main avenues, let's say. The uh, why, why is there such diversity amongst the arthropods? And what I call the how, where the how is perhaps more focused on the genetics and the genomics. So what are the mechanisms that allow this diversity to have evolved? And thinking about the why, at a very basic level, it simply satisfies our natural curiosity for the world around us. But it also um, begins to help us understand some of the mechanisms in basic animal biology that allow for this diversity to occur, as well as, of course, informing research in ecology and behavior. Now, of course, if you're a bit of a cynic, the why is simply that we are all just self-replicating co coils of DNA, and uh, that is the only reason that uh, you need to explain uh, that di diversity. Coming more to the genomic side and genetic side, shall we say, is uh, this idea of the how. So at a very uh, basic level, uh, we can think of it simply as a process of copy paste with errors that generates uh, some sort of variation upon which selection can act. And that can be applicable at many different uh, levels. But where it becomes interesting now to try to uh, understand the how of genomic uh, evolution is thinking about the levels at which selection is acting, the types of different genomic elements that are being impacted uh, by selection, and the different levels of constraints or the different uh, strengths of constraints that uh, uh, these different elements and levels are exposed to, overall resulting in uh, changes at the genomic level, which uh, produce evolutionary paths, if you like, that are acceptable and indeed lead to evolutionary success. So talking about evolutionary success, in essence, today, what we see in terms of uh, extant species are, I like to think of as the, let's say, the observable results, I've called them here, of natural perturbations, maybe and the occasional uh, slightly less than natural perturbation, like an asteroid or something like that. Um, uh, what we see today are, are, are the success stories, if you like, of the evolutionary process. And in a sort of traditional uh, observable results, before the days of uh, uh, molecular biology, we can think of in this case, for example, all of the different uh, types of wing forms that have evolved across insects as different successful solutions to the challenges that life have, has posed each of these groups in their uh, natural ecosystems. Now, of course, if you think of the, let's say, the, the, the modern day equivalent with uh, genetics and genomics, this is just one example. But here we're looking at a gene tree of uh, ionotropic receptors just in three uh, species of fly, well, two mosquitoes and a fly. And if you think about it, this is also in essence uh, us comparing how each of these different species have come up with their own solution to life's challenges. In this case, smelling the environment around them in order to uh, uh, take advantage of their ecosystem. So. Uh, with that sort of conceptual um, uh, introduction out the way, then I think I can uh, now proceed to some of the examples, uh, starting at um, the, the level of uh, the, the genus. And for that, I would like to start with our recent work on uh, bumblebee uh, evolutionary genomics, focusing on the, the bombus genus. 
Um, we sampled and sequenced uh, 17 new uh, bumblebee species, adding to the two uh, existing uh, um, sequence species, terrestrials and impassions, to produce a total of uh, 19 uh, genomes spanning the entire Bombus genus, with uh, representatives from each of the 15 uh, recognized subgenera. So, uh, not an in incredibly deep sampling, shall we say, but a very broad sampling. And also including uh, species with some, let's say, peculiarities. So a couple of species that are adapted to live at very high altitudes, and uh, also a couple of species that are known as uh, cuckoo bumblebees, because they are social parasites, so they take over the nests of other bumblebees. Um, <clears throat> and so with this, we were then able to uh, perform the evolutionary feature analysis, uh, looking at the whole genome alignments, looking at copy number changes over the span of the whole genus to look for which are the most uh, and least uh, dynamically evolving genes and gene families and how they might relate to uh, the specific uh, biology or the, the ecosystems that each of these different uh, lineages are uh, adapted to. And so just to start with the, the more technical side, um, we are, let's say, uh, somewhat lucky with uh, the, the bumblebees, um, not too large genomes, and we're able to sample from the, the haploid uh, males, so it helps with the uh, genome sequencing and assembly process to uh, reach some uh, pretty good contiguity with excellent gene space uh, completeness and uh, gene repertoire of about uh, 15, 16,000 uh, genes across the entire um, uh, genus. So then we can begin to look at things like uh, how the genome size has changed across the genus. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about uh, transposable element uh, content or the orthology results per se, but we can catalog, uh, characterize the gene repertoire into um, the conserved core, if you like, all the way down to what appear as lineage specific uh, inventions at this point. And in addition, we were able to get enough sample uh, and decent sequencing results for five of these species to uh, be able to produce five chromosomal level uh, assemblies, which was, you know, I mean, these days we're getting more and more chromosomal level assemblies coming out as uh, default, but this was, uh, let's say, early on in this process. And so we were very uh, uh, proud of that uh, achievement. And so one of the things that we could actually look at now that we had chromosome level assemblies was um, uh, trying to answer this question about, you know, what uh, genomic rearrangements have led to this uh, 25 chromosome carrier type in these uh, social uh, parasite bumblebees, which were previously thought to be a completely different uh, genus, partly because of this uh, carrier type uh, reason, but also because of their behavior. So the standard, let's say, is 18 chromosomes, and these um, social parasites have 25. And because we were able to assemble chromosome level assemblies, we can actually begin to trace the evolutionary events that have occurred that have led to uh, the switch from the ancestral 18 chromosomes to this derived 25 chromosomes. And of course, this uh, figure shows lots of changes going on, but here just highlighting some of the clearer ones, shall we say. So where you have clear maintenance of some chromosomes, others that have uh, split in two, and others that have seemed to be formed from cutting off various bits of uh, uh, other uh, chromosomes from the ancestral form. And so this is really interesting to see basically how the carrier type has changed and what has moved where in uh, these bumblebee genomes. Going back to the gene level, if you like, instead of the genome level, and just looking at one example here of the evolutionary features that we are typically uh, characterizing for these uh, uh, genus level uh, comparative genomics analyses that we're performing. So what we're looking at here is uh, the gene ontology enrichment for the fastest evolving genes in terms of their protein sequence evolution. So orthologs across the genus and measuring protein sequence divergence and looking for gene ontology terms that are enriched there. Now, of course, you get lots and lots of terms and then you need to try to uh, summarize them. And so as part of this, uh, we 
we developed a, a tool for visualizing and summarizing uh, gene ontology enrichment lists. And just for example here, we have on the fast evolving end of the spectrum, proteins involved in uh, sensory perception, uh, as well as uh, several terms and processes associated with amino acid metabolism and a group of terms associated with uh, chitin metabolism in these bumblebees. Then on the uh, other end of the spectrum, so the slowest evolving genes in terms of their protein sequence, that is, uh, we have genes involved in uh, ubiquitination, uh, in protein transport, and in uh, signal transduction. In particular, uh, the wind pathway uh, members uh, seem to be particularly slowly evolving. So this is not necessarily a, a demonstration of a biological uh, result per se, but it's a demonstration of using the evolutionary features to partition genes into fast and slow evolving ones and look at what types of processes are associated with either end of the spectrum. So uh, those fast evolving chemosensory uh, perception genes uh, are obviously of interest in the context of bumblebee biology because of the different specializations in foraging and uh, the flowers that they visit. At the gene uh, uh, sequence uh, level, we observe uh, relaxed constraints for uh, processes involved in smell perception, odorant binding, and odorant uh, receptor activity. And we also find at the copy number level where olfactory and gustatory receptors appear to be uh, enriched for lineage specific um, orthologous groups and to be rather uh, variable in their copy numbers. Interestingly though, when you reconstruct the evolutionary history of the entire set of uh, olfactory receptors here, you get a fairly stable um, overall number across the genus, even if there are changes in the individual orthologous groups. And uh, basically of note, there are two uh, notable uh, reductions. One uh, here in these uh, two species of uh, high altitude bumblebees, where we can hypothesize that because of the reduced floral diversity at uh, high altitudes, they uh, can dispense of some of their repertoire of odorant receptors. And perhaps more convincingly or more interestingly, here these are the two um, social parasites where there's also been a, a, a loss. And here we could think perhaps that because they enslave um, the bumblebees nests, uh, the bumblebees in the nest that they take over, they don't actually do any of the foraging themselves. So perhaps they are also able to dispense with some of their repertoire of odorant receptors. So at the genus level, um, I've also included here uh, this uh, mosquito picture just to remind, remind me to tell you that this uh, bumblebee work is basically the third of this sort of uh, large scale genus wide comparative study. The first, of course, being the 12 Drosophila, the second here being our 16 Anopheles genomes, and now 19 uh, bumblebee genomes. And essentially, we're performing uh, genome wide. Uh, across the genus, quantifications of how the genome structures have evolved, how the genome contents have evolved, and quantifying these gene evolutionary dynamics to see how they vary across the species. And of course, in terms of the mosquitoes, the ultimate aim here is to uh, help us control populations of disease vectors. And in terms of the bumblebees, to understand their biology and their sensitivities, shall we say, to the environment, to help uh, protect bumblebee diversity and the overall health of these uh, important pollinators. So now from the genus uh, to the order, and for the order I picked uh, this time Coleoptera as an example, uh, and focusing on uh, a study where we looked at uh, teasing apart this uh, relationship between uh, uh, beetle plant interactions and the idea that feeding on plants uh, has in some uh, respect contributed to the incredible diversity that we see amongst uh, Coleoptera. So here the premise is that beetles feed on plants and in turn the plants uh, defend themselves by producing uh, toxins etc. And so the beetles then have to evolve mechanisms to try to neutralize these uh, plant defenses and so this uh, cycle continues. So there's some uh, evolutionary expectation for a signature to be found in uh, the genomes of plant feeding beetles. 
So to investigate that, uh, we're basically asking the question of if this uh, species diversity can be somewhat explained by uh, this arms race, if you like, between uh, their uh, detoxification systems and the plants uh, on which they're trying to feed. More specifically, we're looking at the patterns of gene and genome evolution uh, in different uh, beetle groups to see if there's any evidence that supports this hypothesis. And to be more clear about the hypothesis, uh, essentially we are uh, proposing that the plant-eating beetles are, more, uh, are likely to have more of these uh, important detoxification enzymes than the non-plant-eating, so the, the, the predatory beetles, shall we say, shall we call them just for simplicity. And one possible mechanism is, of course, that uh, plant-eating beetles have, over time, acquired many more copies of these types of, uh, of genes that encode these types of enzymes. And these types of enzymes, we're talking about uh, P450s, carboxylesterases, UDP, UDTs, and glutathione uh, S-transferases, for example. So here, uh, to address this, we looked at uh, what available data we had, and that included uh, at that time only nine uh, full complete transcriptomes from the mainly predatory uh, suborder of beetles, and a mix of transcriptomes and genomes from uh, the mainly plant-eating eating, uh, suborder of beetles. And this is really thanks to you know, collaborations through uh, consortia like the I5K and the OneKite that we were able to uh, build up a data set you know, of 18 different beetle species to be able to ask these kinds of questions, which you can't really do if you only have one plant eating species and one uh, predatory species. So to summarize, because we, we need to uh, keep, uh, let's say, light on the, on the methodological details, um, we uh, reconstructed the species phylogeny, and then we used uh, gene gain and loss inference to map where gains and losses have occurred on the species phylogeny. And if we have the plant eaters down here and the predatory beetles up here, uh, more uh, dynamic gene family evolution, evolutionary histories were found amongst the plant feeders than uh, the predatory beetles. And this is across all genes, so not just focusing on those that are specific uh, candidates for detoxification families. There were more uh, gene gains in more gene uh, families, and there were indeed fewer losses that were uh, spread out over uh, more families. So there's uh, a maintenance of this uh, dynam dynamism, if you like, across all gene families. But then this could just be related to the greater species diversity of the plant feeders and not necessarily directly related to this uh, interaction with the plant toxins. So this is where we need to look at the candidate genes for detoxification. And uh, amongst the most significantly rapidly changing families, these uh, candidate detox families were significantly overrepresented. Uh, suggesting that, at least in part, this is driving these um, lineage-specific expansions that we find in uh, the plant-feeding uh, beetle group. And this uh, next question, are these expansions really adaptive, um, was really an interesting one because I, I, I would you know, hold up my hand uh, myself and say that quite often we stop at the previous step. We observe a change and we make some sort of link to a possible biology, and we don't try to put a evolutionary uh, test, an evolutionary model of whether it actually makes sense that it is actually adaptive. And so here, what we did is uh, those candidate gene families that appeared as lineage specific expansions in the plant feeders, um, we uh, tested two different models, uh, evolutionary models of uh, neutral evolution versus uh, adaptive evolution. And globally, amongst uh, uh, all of the lineage-specific expansions, there were uh, many more adaptive ones in the set of plant feeding species than uh, uh, the predatory beetles. And in addition, there were more amongst the candidate plant uh, detoxification genes. Again, suggesting this uh, causal link, if you like, between what they eat and uh, the dynamism of their gene families and these specifically, um, these lineage expansions. And because examples always help to sort of drive home the point, 
this is an example of the glutathione S transferase family, where in red you can see the genes from the plant feeders, and in blue from the predators. And just by eye, you can see that there are definitely more amongst the plant feeders. But the preferred evolutionary model does indeed support two optima, where there's almost double the number in the plant feeders. So uh, that was a rather fast uh, introduction there to the order level case, but hopefully it uh, provides an example of uh, the kinds of um, analyses that um, we are now able to do. Then moving to the phylum level, uh, I would present our uh, recent work on the 76 arthropods that we compared as part of the uh, I5K uh, pilot study. And here across the phylum, we were essentially asking three main questions. So uh, what changes have occurred, where and when have they occurred across the phylogeny? Then how are these different types of changes uh, perhaps connected or indeed are they even connected? And can we uh, relate these changes to uh, evolutionary success events across the phylogeny? And so to try to summarize this very big study that involved a lot of people and probably some of you in the audience here as well, um, we are comparing 76 species across 21 different orders with over a million genes in 40,000 uh, gene families or orthologous groups. Of course, the first thing that we have to establish is some sort of uh, reliable species phylogeny. And again, in this audience, there'll be people who disagree with this one, I'm sure, at least some of the nodes, um, to reconstruct the species tree and then to infer the evolutionary events that have occurred over uh, time since the last common ancestor. I'm focusing on uh, uh, gene family uh, changes, so copy number changes and protein domain content changes across the phylogeny. And just briefly to summarize, we have uh, 180,000 expansions, half as many contractions, 70,000 extinctions, and about 9,000 novelties catalogued across this uh, phylogeny. And in terms of uh, domains, about half involving fusions, uh, many fewer involving fissions, uh, quite a high level of loss, and a very low level of novelties. But take the novelties with a pinch of salt because most protein domains are defined in species that have been studied. And many of these species have not been studied in uh, nearly as much detail as, for example, Drosophila. So what were we able to do with these uh, quantifications of changes over evolutionary time? The first, um, looking at uh, um, uh, sequence uh, uh, evolutionary changes, um, we uh, kind of expect that some of the fastest rates uh, for some of these changes might be linked to, let's say, regions on the tree, on the phylogeny, where they were experienced uh, small population sizes or strong uh, selective pressure. And uh, indeed, we found some of the fastest uh, rates of sequence evolution, at least, during the early diversification of the holometabolous insects, where you have this uh, rapid diversification. When we compare the other two sort of major metrics that we looked at, so that of uh, gene gain and loss and um, domain rearrangements, what we find is that while the domain rearrangements and the gene gain and loss are uh, strongly correlated, neither of them are uh, correlated with sequence evolutionary rate. So this is suggesting that while bursts of species diversifications might have sort of left behind this uh, signature in the form of some sort of elevated sequence evolution, a gene family and protein domain evolution are for the most part um, disconnected from that process and proceed uh, more or less at their, at their own pace, if you like. So uh, bringing it now back to the biology, um, what are the, 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 the most dynamically evolving gene families across the entire phylogeny? And these we found to be involved in processes linked to digestion, uh, detoxification coming up again, and um, uh, chitin meta metabolism. So the, clearly um, uh, what you feed on and, and how you manage to uh, digest it, as well as your ability to uh, remodel your exoskeleton have been key contributing factors to the changes that have allowed um, arthropod diversity to emerge, if you like. 
Then, of course, um, we're also asking, let's say, where have some of these emergent gene families <clears throat> appeared on the tree and could they be linked to some of the major transitions in uh, arthropod evolutionary uh, history? And so we found only about 150 at the last common ancestor of insects. And at least somewhat surprisingly at first, perhaps very few at the uh, emergence of the last common ancestor of the holometabolous uh, insects. But we can debate that whether it's surprising or not, just changing how you develop uh, timing wise, if you like. Um, and then amongst some of the um, lineages with uh, the most emergent gene families, one of the, the biggest surprises was at the root or the, the ancestor of the Lepidoptera with almost uh, over a thousand different uh, emergent gene families really dwarfing any of the other clades that we have so far been able to sample. Of course, the frustration here is that these are uh, lineage specific families, which means that uh, predicting what their functions might be is uh, particularly difficult. And so this is where I think uh, really the next stages are to uh, um, better develop the functional genomic sides of things so that we can begin to have an idea of what some of the biological functions are of uh, some of these genes and gene families that uh, have emerged as lineage specific innovations over evolutionary time. So in the last uh, couple of minutes, I would like to um, think a little bit about where we are now, shall we say, and uh, what this means for the next steps in uh, scaling up arthropod evolutionary genomics. Uh, this graph I made like half an hour before <laughs> the presentation and just focusing on uh, Insecta. And the blue line is the number of new assemblies added to NCBI each year. And the orange line is the cumulative um, sum, if you like. And so in terms of Insecta, we're already uh, over 600. Um, this is uh, assemblies at uh, NCBI. So imagine how many more there are out there sitting on uh, PhD students and postdocs uh, laptops waiting to be finalized and submitted finally to NCBI. So we're looking at an incredible growth rate that uh, brings with it you know, new opportunities for uh, genus level, order level, and phylum level uh, uh, comparative analyses. And so this uh, figure here is now for Arthropoda, a similar kind of uh, counting, basically looking at uh, which of the different orders are best represented in the current genomic resources. And we see uh, Diptera, Hymenoptera, and Lepidoptera really, you know, pushing the boat out. Um, and so despite these you know, taxonomic sampling biases um, and uh, the variable uh, contiguity here shown with the uh, assembly N50 distributions for each of these uh, groups and variable gene space completeness uh, shown with the percentage of uh, complete buscos for each group, the, the, the data are really accumulating uh, at, a, at, a, at a rapid rate. And the good news is that uh, when you compare completeness against either contiguity or against assembly size, is that up here in the sort of right-hand corner of uh, both of these plots is really telling us that we are now uh, in a position where we are able to produce really high quality uh, genomic data. So this is really good contiguity and completeness for these genome assemblies. And here we're even reaching into uh, above one gigabase uh, uh, genome assembly sizes. So where previously uh, it was rather difficult to get some of these uh, to the quality that is needed to then be able to do uh, comprehensive comparative genomics and make robust inferences. So finally, uh, where does this leave us, if you like, in, in terms of what's next for uh, arthropod genomics? Um, the, the, the new genomes and, uh, and, and their annotations, of course, are really allowing us to unpick some of the more complicated uh, relationships amongst all of the different arthropod species. So really uh, taking phylogenomics to the next level. Then uh, through the comparative approaches, but like I also said, with a, still with a need for functional genomics to complement it, is really um, as we fill in the species across the phylogeny, we get a much denser sampling and a much better resolution. 
and we're able to uh, build much more informed hypotheses about the putative functions of all of these genes in all of these new genomes that we're sequencing and you know related to all sorts of different uh, biological processes of of interest to us as a community and then like i tried to say at the beginning uh, this idea of focusing on the the why related to the biology and the how related to the mechanism so the what types of genomic changes are allowed how frequently do they occur and eventually begin to link this to uh, how evolution proceeds to result in the biodiversity that we observe today. And so that's where I stress as I come to the end, the importance of the methods and the databases and the software and the workflows that need to scale up as well to cope with this increasing amount of data uh, and to actually make the most of it. And I see Astrid uh, coming online there, which means I'm on my last slide with a bit of a philosoph philosophical uh, finish, if you like. So a whirlwind tour of lots of comparative, uh, mostly genomics uh, examples, but just to stress that this is something that we as human beings kind of, we cannot help ourselves, but compare things, right? Uh, long before we had access to DNA, long before we had genomes and genes and um, gene families, um, here, just depicting uh, in a sketch, the different attitude of these two uh, groups of mosquitoes. And attitude is a, is a funny word, but it's sort of how they are, are, are sitting, where um, Anopheles is, is, is much more angular, whereas Culex is this humpbacked uh, shape. And so uh, one of my long-term ambitions is to find uh, the gene that controls mosquito attitude at some point <laughs> in the future. So with that, I acknowledge all of my group members and uh, this slide should be full of all of the other collaborators that I have over the, the years worked with who are fantastic, uh, and, but I can't squeeze them all in. So I just have to thank them in one like that. And thank you for your attention. And I hope we have some time for some questions.